Okay. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'm in a different location, and hopefully the internet will cooperate. Um, so we've uh, basically finished all our discussion of uh, Z2 spin liquids um, and Z2 gauge theories and the idea of topological order, and we're going to move on to a new topic, which is the study of fermions and bosons in one dimension today. Uh, we'll return to Z2 spin liquids a bit later uh, in a more modern language uh, once we consider some other topological phases in the next chapter. Anyway, are there any questions? Okay, and I also did send you email and Slack notifications up for uh, uh, for your uh, pre class presentations, uh, please you know feel free to contact me and have a chat if you want ideas, uh, uh, or just send me what you think you want to do, and I'll post it on the uh, uh, on on the Canvas site. Okay, um, all right. So uh, so we've studied fermions and bosons. Uh, at the beginning of the course. And what we learned was if you have weakly interacting fermions, uh, they form uh, a Fermi liquid, uh, they form a Fermi surface, uh, uh, and then you have fermionic quasi-particles on the, on the surface. And when we studied bosons, uh, we found that at zero temperature, they always both condense, uh, and, and then the excitations are uh, are just sound waves or oscillation of the phase of the condensate. Uh, and there's a long range order in, uh, in, in the phase. So, so you have a microscopic occupation of the zero momentum mode. All right, now both of those conclusions uh, don't hold in one dimension. They hold at zero temperature in two and higher dimensions, uh, but they don't in one dimension. Uh, and, but fortunately, it turns out fermions and bosons behave almost exactly the same way in one dimension. So you don't have to look to two chapters. You can cover it all in one chapter. Uh, and, uh, sometimes called Luttinger liquids, but more completely perhaps, uh, Tomonaga Luttinger liquids. Um, so of course, when Tomonaga and Luttinger studied this, it was pure, merely a theoretical curiosity. Uh, there were no known materials in one dimension. Uh, today we have lots of examples of micro, you know, mesoscopic and micro, uh, uh, structures where you can easily make, not easily, but routinely make uh, one dimensional electron gases in ultra cold atoms. You can make one dimensional uh, boson systems. And also, as we're going to see, uh, one dimensional systems also appear on the edges of higher dimensional systems, like in the quantum Hall effect, which will be the next chapter. So, so that's, so there's the uh, reason for studying fermions and bosons in matter in one dimension. Uh, and, uh, some of the things and techniques we learned there turn out to be extremely powerful and also helpful in higher dimensional cases. All right. So then. So we'll just, today, I, I suspect I'll only talk about free particles. So you might think, you know, what's there to say about free particles? Surely we know everything about free particles from undergraduate stand back. Uh, and that's certainly true, but we're going to formulate it uh, in, in, a, in a way that allows you to put in interactions in a relatively straightforward way in one dimension. Uh, and we'll also see a remarkable result that even for free particles, there's a certain limit uh, in which a Fermi gas is exactly equivalent to a bunch of bosons. Um, 
so that's what I'm going to, in fact, that's the first thing we're going to establish. It's an exact uh, and very beautiful result uh, and also quite surprising because uh, naturally you would think, you know, if you have fermions, we can, you can only occupy one fermion per state and then you have bosons who can occupy uh, as many states as you want, I mean, as many bosons in a given state as you want, how can there possibly be a correspondence between the two? Uh, well, uh, that's the peculiarity of infinity. Uh, <laughs> these two infinities in a in a certain well-defined infinite system are equal in a very precise way. Okay, so let's see how that works. So here I just start out with a uh, some band structure with fermions moving in free fermions moving in some bands with dispersion e k. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the full Hamiltonian period. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to linearize around, we're going to only look at low energy excitations near the Fermi points, the KF and minus KF. Uh, I'm going to consider only things that have inversion symmetry for the most part, but we'll develop a formalism that will also allow us to, uh, to talk about chiral systems in which they only have right movers or left movers. Okay, so if you linearize the momentum around this point, uh, then the epsilon K, which vanishes at KF, uh, just becomes VFK on the right edge and minus VFK on the left edge. Um, and then you also identify this region here, uh, this region over here. In this region, you say that C of KF plus K is equal to some new fermion, which I'll call a right mover at momentum K. Uh, and on this region over here, you say that C of minus KF plus K is a left mover with momentum K. Notice little K always increases to the right. Uh, you know, this, this K here is always increasing to the right. Uh, it's just that the point is at minus K. So the energy here for the left movers, so if you write it in terms of right and left movers, the energy for left right movers increases with K and the energy for left movers decreases with K. Okay, any other, any, if somebody had a comment or a question? All right, so that's the theory. Uh, but of course, to make the theory well-defined, I have to put a cutoff uh, at this can't hold for all K. Uh, there's a cutoff lambda. And we're going to look at the limit where lambda goes to infinity, where things don't depend on the cutoff, at least to begin with. Uh, and that requires, you know, actually some careful, as usual when you have infinities, you have to be careful to subtract them carefully. Uh, and we're going to subtract that, but it turns out it's very trivial here in 1D. All you have to do uh, is what's called normal order every expression, just subtract the ground state value. So for example, if you're uh, talking about energies, uh, then whenever we talk about energies, we refer to energies relative to the field Fermi C. And then you don't, then there are no more infinities and lambda can go to infinity, at least for the free Fermi gas. Okay. So I decided here that I'm going to actually, you know, I have typed up nodes and I'm, so many of the equations are rather complicated and I don't want to get them wrong. So I'm going to use my notes, if it's okay with you, uh, and try to intersperse pages like these where I put in a few more comments. Okay. So in real space, this is how you do this. So you have some Fermi field as a function of X. You decompose into a right mover near the right Fermi point and a left mover near the left Fermi point. And now we're going to assume that X is slowly uh, And then this Hamiltonian here, this one right here uh, in, in real space is this Hamiltonian here. We just expand uh, you get one derivative for the right movers, that's Vf times k if you go to momentum space, and that's Vf times minus k if you go to uh, for the left movers. Uh, and the imaginary time of Lagrangian uh, is psi dagger d by d tau. Uh, that's the usual uh, very phrase term that appears in the path integral. And you can now also see from this that this is looks like a relativistic uh, theory. In fact, it is precisely the theory of a relativistic massless Dirac fermion in one plus one dimensions. So Fermi gas at low energies, free Fermi gas looks like free Dirac, one 
derived from yarn. I'm include, I mean, I'm completely ignoring spin in this entire chapter because it's easy to just add it as another index later. We're just considering the spinless Fermi gas. Okay. All right. So still beating the dead horse. I'm just going to talk talk about that, uh, uh, the system a bit more. Uh, I'm going to now put it in a finite system of size L. Uh, in fact, a circle. I'm going to put this fermion on a circle because I want to count energy levels. Uh, and I'm going to take uh, anti-periodic boundary conditions. Okay, psi of uh, x plus l is going to be minus psi of x. And that's anti-periodic is more convenient because we don't want any fermions exactly at zero energy. Uh, um, you can do it with periodic and uh, anyway, this is a little easier. Uh, and this kind of thing is a bread and, bread and butter of a string theory. There's I forget, there's Nevo Schwartz and Ramon Ramon boundary conditions for fermions on a string. Here, here we're really talking about actual ring uh, with fermions moving in that both left and right movers on that ring. Okay, so with this boundary condition, uh, then I have then I don't take Fourier transform, I take Fourier series. And so the Fourier components of psi uh, are here to and, and this is then the wave vector here. So the wave vector. Uh, is now quantized in units of pi x over L, odd multiples of pi x over L, 2n minus 1. Mm -hmm. 2n minus over L, 1 times pi. So those are the allowed values of the wave vector uh, once you take these anti-periodic boundary conditions. Um, and then uh, the Hamiltonian itself, uh, you pull out the factor of pi Vf over L, um, and then you just have the energy 2n minus one, odd numbers times psi dagger n psi n. And now you notice I let uh, e n run from minus, n run from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, that of course induces uh, infinities. I mean, really I should put a cutoff just like I put a cutoff here. Uh, but I'm going to say that really what I should subtract from this is the ground state energy. So I'm only going to look at excitations that have uh, near the uh, near the Fermi level or that have a finite energy. So I subtract the energy uh, of, uh, of this occupied Fermi C where I imagine that this linear dispersion really extends out to infinity. Uh, but as long as all the excitations are down here, my temperature is low enough, I'm only looking at things here, there will be no more infinities, oh gosh. I erased that, that beautiful picture, sorry. Okay, I'll have to, I'll draw that in later. All right, so the way you do this uh, is by just putting two dots. So the, the, the dots is reminding you that if you have any operator, then dot dot of any operator uh, is equal to that operator minus the expectation value of the operator in the ground state. So that's what you call normal ordering. So this is common notation everywhere. Uh, and so we can write the Hamiltonian, which is not written here. So the Hamiltonian, the correct Hamiltonian, which has no infinities, uh, is sum on n goes from minus infinity. I mean, n can run freely from minus infinity to infinity to n minus one, uh, okay, times nothing, times dot dot psi dagger r and psi r n. Okay, so that's the normal. Uh, as the charge of any excitations of the right movers is also defined by subtracting the charge of the, we assume that the vacuum, the ground state of the Fermi C has zero charge. Okay, so now let's, for this Hamiltonian written right here of the, just the right movers, uh, let's just compute the partition function. Okay, so that's, uh, let me do that on the next page, uh, write it out. So, yeah. yeah excuse me. Yes. I, I think you, you made a comment, but well, I just wondering how do you look at, look at this? You said that uh, choosing anti-periodic or periodic boundary condition will, or will not affect what you are going to discuss? It will affect, I just want to work with, with, one, with the case that I, is simpler, that's all. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. 
So I'm working with only with anti-periodic boundary conditions. And I'll show the equivalence between fermions and bosons for anti-periodic boundary condition. There is a more complicated equivalence for periodic boundary condition, which I will not discuss. But we're only interested in the thermodynamic limit and most of the things we'll talk about anyway. But it's interesting just for this subsection to just look at what happens in a finite ring. Of course, string theorists are always interested in the finite case because that's the, that is the string literally, but I'm not. Okay. Uh, so what is the partition function? Well, the partition function of a Fermi gas, uh, as you know, is the basically product on, uh, you, know, you know, one plus e to the minus e k over t over product of all possible k. Uh, and so this will become product uh, on n times um, one plus, you'll get e to the minus uh, 2n minus one pi over L, that's the wave vector times Vf over T. Uh, and N goes from minus infinity to infinity. Um, okay. So now I just uh, I want to pull out the ground state energy, which is infinite. So th this 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 product as defined doesn't make much sense. It has exponentially growing terms, but if I pull out the ground state energy, uh, it's uh, e to the minus e naught over t. So time product, and then you can see from n equals one uh, to infinity of one plus. Uh, and I'm going to write it as Q to the power 2N minus one uh, whole squared, where Q is just E to the minus pi VF over LT. So that's the partition function at any temperature. Uh, uh, and basically what's happened is if I took the negative values of N, I just pulled out uh, uh, the ground state energy, which is basically sum over E zero uh, is just sum over N, N uh, um, less than one of two N minus one uh, uh, pi VF over L. That's the ground state energy. So you just pull that factor out and then you find that the positive and negative energies give you the same factor and that's how you get the square. Okay, and you can also, you know, if I expand this out okay, in powers of Q, this is a very, very useful expansion. If I write this out in powers of Q, uh, Z is some, some power series in Q with some coefficient Cn times Q to the power N, uh, and the smallest coefficient will be zero, in fact. Uh, let's not call that N, let's call that something else. It's not that same n. C sub p q to the p, p from zero to infinity. Uh, then C p, uh, you can just see from the definition of the partition function, is degeneracy. It's an integer. The degeneracy of states uh, with energy, energy relative to the ground state, of course, times p times pi. Vf over L. Okay, you just that just follows from the definition of the partition function, uh, you know, because we know that this is just the same as sum on n of all the many body states e to the minus e n over t. So you just pull out the factors of e to the some number times one over t, and then that gives. So if you so that explains this expression here. Okay, so, so this is an expression uh, which tells us that all the energy eigenvalues are integer multiples of pi Vf over L. Uh, and if you expand it out in a power series, uh, you get the co-degeneracy of each one of those levels. All right, free Fermi gas, just written in the world's most complicated way. <laughs> okay, all right, so now I'm gonna take a Bose gas, but not the usual Bose gas that we saw. We're gonna take a relativistic Bose gas. Uh, and I'm going to argue uh, that the relativistic Bose gas has the same energy levels and the same degeneracies uh, as the relativistic Fermi gas. Uh, so, okay, so let's do that. 
So let's get another page here. So now the bo the bosonic page of the bosonic uh, uh, Hamiltonian will be H uh, is just a bunch of bosons with some n integer n, and the energy of each boson will be 2 pi Vf over L times n times n times B dagger n Bn. Okay, so it turns out that the partition function of this Hamiltonian, uh, here n is greater than uh, uh, is equal to one to infinity, it has to be positive. Uh, you can't have bosons of negative energy. They can cause, then, then you know, you just get infinite number of bosons in the negative energy states. Uh, fermions of negative energy are fine. You can just normal order them and subtract out the ground state and you're fine. Everything is stable because once the, but bosons, yeah, it's a total disaster when they have negative energy. Okay, so what are these bosons? Well, it turns out these bosons are very simply related to the fermions. So, you know, we had this Fermi gas here with some states here. Uh, you know, this say, say this, is the, this is the Fermi level. So the first state was pi Vf over L. Uh, the next one is three pi Vf over L. And the next one is five pi Vf over L and so on. And these states are occupied in the ground state and those states are empty. So what is the boson? The boson will turn out to be a particle hole excitation. A boson will be something uh, that takes you from, knocks a fermion out of this state into that state. Uh, and this, this is going to uh, go n steps. So that the energy for this uh, will be two pi uh, Vf over L with n, in this case, n is three, because I've got three steps up. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and what we're going to show now uh, that this is it's actually perfectly valid in 1D to think of this excitation as a canonical boson. It has the right sort of boson commutation relations uh, and so on. So, but before we actually uh, show that at the level of operators, let's see it at the level of the partition function that the energy levels of the Bose system are the same as the energy level uh, of, the, of the Fermi system. Okay, it turns out that the energy level of this Bose system um, are the same as energy level of the Fermi system up to one caveat. And the one caveat, which you can already see from here, so in the Bose system, when you move a fermion from here to there, you preserve the total number of fermions. So there's a conservation law here that if I think of the boson as a particle full pair, it doesn't change the number of fermions. Whereas in the partition function, for the fermions, which we evaluated right here, we did this in the grand canonical ensemble. We did it work some chemical potential mu, and we did preserve the number of fermions. So what we have to do is to keep, uh, add another degree of freedom to the Bose system. It's just a single degree of freedom, which is the total fermionic charge, okay? And then we'll be done, all right? So what is, so we define this operator Q sub R, which is the total fermionic charge. Uh, and it has integer eigenvalues. It could be negative or positive. And if what is the ground state? Assuming the ground state has charge zero, what is the ground state and what is the energy of the minimum of the smallest energy state with charge Q? Okay, well, you just occupy, so you can see that here, you just occupy uh, Uh, if you're going to get add some particles with have a ground have a state with energy Q. So basically, you know, here's your Fermi level. These are the occupied states. And if you have charge Q, well, you occupy the first three states. Or if you occupy, you know, charge five, you occupy the first five states. So the energy uh, of a charge Q state is the sum of the first Q odd numbers, which as you know, is just the square. So therefore, <laughs> You can, uh, the boson system has to be supplemented by another degree of freedom, uh, just a bunch of integers QR, uh, where the energy of a state with QR has an additive constant of pi VF QR squared over L, okay? So now let's compute the partition function of the Bose system. 
So what is the partition function of a Bose system? Well, it has two contributions. So Z bosons. Uh, that's going to be equal to, well, first of all, the usual, you know, if I just did the usual Bose partition function, it's product of K over one minus one minus E to the minus EK over T. This is for some bosons with energy EK. Uh, this is just the Bose partition function. Uh, I hope that's correct. <laughs> okay, yes. So that's the big factor. But then I also have to remember that there is additional total charge degree of freedom. And in the partition function, that's just simply a multiplicative factor. So it'll be sum on Q from minus infinity to infinity of E to the minus the energy of the state uh, with Q over T, where E sub Q uh, is this expression that I just had over here, uh, this expression right here, that's E sub Q. All right. Um, okay, so now and here EK, of course, is just that number over there. So EK gets replaced uh, by 2 pi N VF over L. And then you just write this in terms of little q. And what you will find then, then Z bosons is product from N equals 1 through infinity of 1 minus 1 minus uh, uh, let me make sure I get it right. Uh, yeah, Q to the 2N, the 2 because there's a 2 pi VF over L here. Q to the 2N. And the whole thing multiplied by um, sum on, well, it's right here. Sum on Q goes from minus infinity to infinity, another integer. Uh, and it turns out to be Q to the power to Q squared. Okay, so here's my Bose partition function. It's, in fact, I had to add an extra degree of freedom to bosons, contrary to what you did for Fermier. You would have thought there'd be less, too many states for bosons. In fact, you have to add a few more. So I added uh, this extra total charge degree of freedom over here. Uh, that in the partition function just becomes a multiplicative factor because every state, every charge has the same uh, particle hole excitations. And that's just the usual uh, Bose-Einstein partition function of bosons with this linear dispersion, with this dispersion here, written in a very unfamiliar notation. Okay, so though this gives as a function of temperature or more conveniently as a function of little q, which is just a function of temperature, uh, the entire partition function of a Bose system uh, of a relativistic Bose gas with an overall charge degree of freedom. Okay, and here's the partition function for fermions, uh, uh, which is right here. Where is it? Yeah, so this is the fermion right here. Uh, oops. We're going to, of course, throw this guy out. It's just an overall normalization. We have subtracted that. Okay, so now the claim is that these two functions are exactly the same. All right, now I can't resist actually showing, checking this on Mathematica, it's fun. So let me just show you how that works. So let me open up my Mathematica file. Um, yes, all right, then share screen. Oops. Okay, you can all see my Mathematica file. Okay, so here on the top uh, is the fermion partition function. Here M is some upper cutoff, uh, some large number like a thousand or whatever you want. Uh, and so this is the fermion one plus Q to the R power of the odd numbers, I goes from one through M. So that's the fermion partition function. And then the boson is what I told you, this is the Bose-Einstein partition function here uh, and multiplied by the sum, uh, by that's the, what you can call the capacitance term. Every time you add a certain charge, there's an energy of order Q squared. Okay, so that's this. And uh, so now I put M equals 100 and look the first 100 terms of these things. 
Uh, and so this is the series for the fermions, uh, and this is the series for the bosons, and you can just check they're exactly the same. So this tells you, for example, that in the Fermi system, uh, with energy 55 times pi Vf over L, there are 8,888 states, and so on. <laughs> and in the Bose system, too, there are exactly 8,888 states. Okay. <laughs> so, so that seems like magic, uh, but it's not magic. Uh, it can be proven. Uh, well, depending on your taste, what you mean by proof, uh, you can prove it by appealing to looking up some fancy identities from the theories of elliptic functions, and you'll find that those two functions of Q are the same. Uh, I think it's Euler's identity. Okay. Or you can uh, be a physicist and I'll give you a physicist proof. So here's the physicist proof. It's all in this picture. Uh, yeah, this picture here. So here's a physicist proof that the Fermi system and the Bose system are the same. Okay, so here I have uh, two, two states. Uh, one is the ground state of the fermions. Okay, so this, this, is, this is momentum. This direction is momentum. So the block, black dots mention occupy, uh, occupied states, and these are empty states. So this is some state with some charge Q. Uh, this is the reference state with charge Q. Okay. Uh, it could be the ground state, but doesn't matter because adding charge Q just shifts the Fermi wave vector, so it doesn't change anything. All right. So that's the, uh, uh, that's the Fermi state. So now I give you, uh, uh, and, and then I have an excited state, and the excited state is, happens to be this one. So it's some state where this is, these are full, these are empty, this is full, this is empty, and so on. This is some excited state of the Fermi system. Okay, so now what I want to prove for that for every such excited state for the Fermi system, I can define one and only one uh, Bose system, Bose state. Okay, so what is the Bose state? Well, the Bose state is given by these numbers. I have a series of non-decreasing integers. So what does this these tell me? This tell me that I have one boson with energy one in units of uh, two pi Vf over L. So one boson of energy one, two bosons with energy two, one boson with energy three, Five, two bosons in energy five, one boson with energy six, and no other bosons. Okay. And now you can see the correspondence. So to get from, so if you, once you give me a Bose state, I'm going to get you a, a Fermi state and vice versa. So how do I get you a Fermi state from a Bose state? Well, from a Bose state, what I do is I first take the boson with the highest possible energy and I hit it on the fermion with the highest possible energy. And so this, this fermion goes up six steps to that point. Then I take the next boson with the next lowest energy, and then that goes up exactly five steps. This also went up five steps and so on. And I keep doing this until I run out of bosons. And now the point is that, do I get a valid Fermi state? Or like if I get a valid Fermi state, provided I'm guaranteed, uh, that I'm never going to occupy any state with two fermions. That would be a disaster. But because I ordered them, I first started with the highest boson state. I'm guaranteed there could be no collisions. So this goes up six steps. All subsequent bosons are less than And so they're never going to ever try to occupy this one because they are smaller steps. So therefore, what I've proven is that for every Bose state, there's a unique Fermi state. Uh, and you can also prove the converse that for every Fermi state, there's a unique Bose state by just undoing this. You take the largest Fermi state and you see how many steps it needs to go back to the ground state and you take the next one and then send it back again, keep doing it. Uh, and you can see it's completely unique. There's no ambiguity in what bosons you have to move down to get the Fermi ground state. And, and this picture literally is the proof of that magical relationship you just saw. So the proof then, so the statement then is that a free, free relativistic free fermion 
is essentially has exactly the same spectrum uh, as a relativistic boson, provided you project onto states with the same total fermion number. And that's all. So that's just like a small, in the thermodynamic limit, this is not such a big deal because it's like going from the canonical to the grand canonical ensemble. Usually what you need to do is to take fermions in the canonical ensemble, relativistic fermion in the canonical example uh, ensemble are exactly equivalent to relativistic bosons with energy that's linear in K and only half a boson in a sense because uh, there's only positive momenta here. Uh, and they are exactly equal. All right. <laughs> and similarly for left movers, you'll have another set of bosons. All right. Is everyone happy with that? So that's a, you know, as I said, quite a surprising statement. Uh, but it's a statement that only holds for linear dispersion and also when you have an infinite dispersion. And so, you know, so, so infinities are strange, you know, just like the set of all integers has the same number as a set of all even integers. They're, they're not different. You can just do a one-to-one -one mapping between them. And similarly here, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the set of all bosons and the set of all fermions considered as the many particle system. All right. Any questions? Everyone happy with that? Okay. So now let's do this at the level of operators. And here there's a lot of algebra and I'm just going to, you know, it's all spelled out, I hope very clearly in the notes. I'm going to try to go a little faster because we are getting rather behind and where I want to be. Uh, so this, so we're going to now uh, try to prove this at the level of operators. So what we've seen, uh, the main thing we've seen here is that we can think of uh, uh, an excitation, a particle hole excitation that moves a fermion from here to there as a boson. Now that operator is basically what appears as Fourier components of the density operator. So for example, if I take the density of right movers, this is again the normal order density uh, on a system of size L, it's the, you know, the total fermion number relative to the ground state divided by L plus the Fourier components uh, there is no zero here because the zero is included in this Q sub R. Uh, and now you do the Fourier expansion. So if you write this uh, psi R, if you had an expansion for psi R over here, uh, some point, yeah. So you take this Fourier expansion, take this Fourier expansion here and put it into the density expression uh, and when you do that, uh, you know, what you will find is the fact that you'll see right away that the density operator, uh, so this can be this up to some factors, can be written as something like psi dagger, uh, uh, some on P, some on P plus N, psi P, e to the 2 pi, I N X over L. So the Pete's Fourier component of the density uh, moves, I'm sorry, the, so you can see here, this, there's a term here that moves a boson, fermion up n steps, uh, and that's the nth Fourier component of the density. Okay. So that's good, all right. So now you take this density operator written in terms of these size, take its Fourier component, and then look at the commutator of two different Fourier components. Now, naively, you would say the psi of x, psi of x, and so that would tell me that rho of x, rho of y, uh, is zero for x not equal to y anyway, <laughs> and something not interesting at x equal to y, because th the psi fields at different points in space commute with psi dagger psi at different points in space commutes with each other. Uh, so yeah, that's true, but there's still something when x approaches y. So there's an anomaly, uh, I guess it's the Schwinger anomaly, uh, that we have to precisely get. And that's crucial to proving this bosonization expression. 
All right, so you just take this commutator. Okay, just turn the crank and this is what you get, uh, where you have a sum over N2. And now comes the tricky part, uh, again, having to do with all these infinities that are floating around. So if you just look at this expression, these two terms will look exactly the same to you because you can just change variables. N2 is a dummy variable. I can change N2 to N2 minus N in the second expression. And then this become N2 minus N, which is the same as that. And this one become N2 minus N prime, which is that. So these two are the same. There's a minus sign, answer equals zero. But that's too quick because this is infinity. And this is also infinity. Uh, and we can't, we have to be very careful when you're subtracting infinities. So what do we have to do? Well, what I told you, what you have to do is normal order everything, okay? So what I should do is write this as uh, equal to normal order of this, you know, it should be equal to uh, psi dagger psi, you know, I won't write down the indices, psi dagger psi normal order plus expectation value in the ground state of psi dagger psi. And I do this for both terms. Okay, this looks, you know, this is the exact identity. This this is just equal to this because the normal order is defined as that minus that. So I just add it. But now the point is for this normal ordered expression, this is always finite in any state that I'm going to consider. So for the normal ordered expression, this is indeed equal to that. So what's left over is the expectation value of the ground state, all right? So what I have to actually evaluate is to have any chance of anything non-zero is to e evaluate the expectation value of the grounds in the ground state. And that's only non-zero when n equals n prime, where n and n prime are the Fourier components of the density. Uh, and now you can evaluate this, and it's, it's equal to n, because that's, you know, you just see how, where, you know, this thing is just equal to zero, you know, that thing is just equal to, uh, theta of minus n2. It's only non-zero for ne negative. Uh, ne only The only occupied states are the ones with n negative. Uh, well, actually, zero is also a negative number here, sorry. But anyway, if you, all of those edge effects work out right, and this is just delta n prime times n. So the densities, Fourier components of the densities don't commute with each other. In fact, the commutator is just some constant. And that, you know, that's in fact establishes what I was trying to show you, that the, the density Fourier components are like bosons, because now I can just rescale the density. So I can just call this B, uh, and I call, call this B dagger for, so the positive Fourier components are called B, the negative Fourier components are called B dagger, and then this relationship after you rescale B and B dagger in some way is just B, B dagger equals one uh, with some factor of the square root of N thrown in. Um, okay, yeah, put a square root of N here and a square root of N here and then you're done. Okay, so, so now we have seen that this anomaly very carefully evaluated by normal ordering this expression tells us that the Fourier components of the density are just canonical bosons which I just showed in a different way before. All right. Uh, so in fact, when, once you identify this and you say that B is just a Fourier component of the density uh, with this identification right here, sorry, right here, uh, you can go back to this Hamiltonian This is on, and I rewrite it in terms of the uh, so there's no n here because the square root of n that got taken out to get the energy of a state with a density rho, uh, and that commutator gives me exactly 2 pi vf n over l which was exactly the energy required to move a fermion up n steps. Okay, so it all hangs together. All right, so now I've shown you that 
this Hamiltonian for the electron density, strangely enough, is precisely equal to, with no corrections whatsoever, in the limit of, uh, you know, no cutoff, and this normal ordering everything. So this Hamiltonian for the for bosons with this commutation relation here, okay, uh, well, this commutation relation here, uh, and this Hamiltonian for the boson is precisely equivalent to the free Fermi of Hamilton. Okay, <laughs> that's this one right here. So this one and this one are precisely equal. I now have more than I had when I started. Not only have I you know, already showed earlier that the spectrum was the same. Now I also have the connection uh, between uh, the operator rho in terms of psi. I can write rho in terms of psi. Uh, well, it's, it's, yeah, you just do the Fourier components on both sides of this equation and you'll get rho in terms of psi, which is written right here. Maybe I should write it out to parents, something like rho n up to some factors, maybe p psi dagger p plus n psi p. With some factors here, which I haven't written out. All right, so there's a standard way to get all these factors right because uh, people have, in both in string theory and in people studying uh, one dimensional systems and uh, use this a great deal. And so I'm gonna to try to use a standard notation here that's present uh, in condensed matter. So yeah, here, here I've written it all out. Here's the, uh, here are the expression for the left movers with some signs being different. Uh, this is the Hamiltonian for the left moving fermions. Um, this is the expression for the density in terms of the left moving fermions. And this is the Hamiltonian for the left moving density. And this is the commutation relation for the left moving density with one minus sign here. Okay. So now what people do, and this is what I was dreading writing out on my board. Uh, there's a standard way to write this out uh, in terms of local fields. We don't like to work with, uh, for, with Fourier components. We want to work with uh, X and Chi, make everything local. Uh, and so you define these two fields, Phi of X and Theta of X, which are Fourier transform of the sum and differences of the right movers and the left moving densities. And all these factors are chosen very, very cleverly to make the following results that I'm going to state work out, okay? So this is how you define everything. You have Q is the total charge of left and right movers. J is the charge of right movers minus the charge of left movers. So these are integers that are just constants of the motion. Um, and phi naught and theta naught are are like conjugate variables to the constants of the motion. So phi naught j is i and phi naught q is i. So phi naught and theta naught are just basic variables that live on a circle. Uh, so that j and q are the canonically conjugate angular momenta, which are quantized in units of integers. Okay. So, so you just introduce these additional quantum degrees of freedom just Again, this won't matter in the thermodynamic limit, but if you want to get everything right on a ring, you have to include them. Uh, you might wonder why am I mixing right movers and left movers because they're just totally different Hilbert spaces. Uh, that's really for historical reasons. Uh, in condensed matter systems, you always have left and right movers. Uh, and so when the notation was developed, people weren't so worried about the situation where they only have left movers and not right movers and the edge of a quantum. In terms of if you want, and uh, this is how you define the fields for the right and left. But for now, let's just follow the standard condensed matter notation and keep right and left movers together. Okay, so you take this expression uh, and then you just uh, work out the commutation relations of phi and theta because you know the commutations relation of rho, you know this commutes with that, and this commutes with that to give you an i. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the other way around, phi naught and j and theta naught and q. Uh, and then when the dust settles, uh, this is what you find with precise expressions. Uh, 
that uh, now look much more elegant. So all that hard work was done for you to write everything in terms of some uh, elegant expressions. So what you find is that phi and, and grad theta are canonically conjugate fields. And theta and grad phi are also canonically conjugate. Or minus grad theta over pi is canonically conjugate to phi, and minus grad phi over pi is canonically conjugate to theta. Phi of x and theta of x are two quantum fields living on the line. And their commutator uh, is this step function, the sine function. So this just follows from represent Fourier representations of the delta function and, and all the commutators I've written down. So there's just a very straightforward algebra, all designed to streamline these horrible factors of n and square root of pi and things that are floating around in various places. So the only pi you have to remember is this pi over here. Okay. And you can also do this in terms of the right moving scalar field phi or the right moving, left moving scalar field phi. They commute with each other and have this without the factor of two, a sine commutator. Okay, so these are now our actual bosons that we're going to deal with. The fermions are the fermions, they're nice continuum limit. So this is how we take the continuum limit of these bosons. Uh, we have these phi and theta fields with this commutator. Uh, and then what is the Hamiltonian? Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so the Hamiltonian, uh, which is the sum of the right and left movers. So now basically you take this Fourier, you take these expressions and you do some inverse Fourier transform and you put it in here uh, and just massage it with lots of algebra. Uh, and when the dust settles, you get a very simple Hamiltonian. Uh, it's basically grad phi squared plus grad theta squared. So maybe it's good to summarize this because it's extremely important. And after a while, anybody working in one dimension or with edge states has, all, has this all memorized. Uh, so the Hamiltonian, uh, what time is it? Okay, okay I have it. Uh, sure. And I don't have, I have to remember the factors of two pi a little bit. Yeah, so it's VF over two pi. Uh, dx times grad theta squared as grad phi squared, sorry, phi squared. And the commutation relation was phi commutator over theta. Um, and yeah, so that's the boson theory, the fermion theory. So this is the uh, boson theory. This is the fermion theory. Uh, well, in in exactly the same way, I would write that as IVF uh, dx. The Hamiltonian is psi dagger r d psi r by dx. Minus psi dagger left, d psi left by dx. And these have the commutation relation that psi r of x, anti commutator psi dagger r of x prime is delta of x minus x prime. And similarly for r goes to left. And of course, left and right anti commute with each other freely. Uh, so the claim is that this theory in the continuum is exactly the same as this theory. So this is a relativistic theory of bosons. Um, let me write that properly. And this is a, uh, oh, I mean, okay. And these are exactly equal, not just in, in infinity, but also in a finite box, uh, as I've just shown you very rather quickly though. Uh, okay. And for, furthermore, we also have an operator relation. Not only are the energy levels of these two defined, the important operator relation that we have established, uh, okay, is this one. So you can work out this relation here, 
that grad phi of x is pi times rho left plus rho right, or grad theta is pi times rho right minus rho left, and then grad phi is this and phi left and phi right. So uh, I should write this out here if I can remember it. So one of them was grad phi is phi times psi dagger psi psi right. And grad theta. So these are the, the famous bosonization formulae written out uh, in the continuum now in, for an infinite system, not worrying so much about edge effects. Uh, you know, relativistic scalar field, relativistic Dirac fermion, they are the same. And here's a relationship between the scalar field and the fermion. So this is a, yeah, so this expresses the, the Bose fields in terms of uh, by linears of the Fermi fields. Okay. I guess I'm out of time. So, so there is one more formula that co completes the Bosonization story. Uh, and that is the inverse of this, which expressed the Fermi field in terms of a Bose field, a single Fermi field. Uh, and that was the last to be discovered. Uh, actually, I think it was discovered first in condensed matter physics and then eventually found its way also into particle theory and also string theory. Uh, it's what's called a vertex operator. So the Fermi operator, Fermi on creation operator is a, is a more complicated expression uh, in terms of phi and theta. Uh, and uh, it requires some subtle arguments and requires you to keep the cutoff around for a little bit longer. Uh, but I'll go through that next time. So that's the main part of the bosonization story I haven't given you. But today, I hope I've established to your satisfaction the exact equivalent uh, of the two theories that are written down here. Maybe I should also mention, this might look uh, rather familiar, unfamiliar. Uh, if you just work out the Lagrangian, and that's in the notes, uh, how that's done. Uh, the Lagrangian of this thing, uh, it just turns out to be, well, man, I can just show you there it is. Uh, it just, it's this. Okay, so that look, should look familiar. They're just a massless relativistic uh, scalar field with, with velocity, while the velocity of light is VF. Uh, and this capital K is one everywhere in all the expressions that you see here. So this, it's easy to derive this, and I've shown how to do this. You just write the path integral, you the commutation relation. The commutator between theta and phi becomes this, this, this term, and you do the path integral, and you integrate over theta, and you get a theory for phi, or you can integrate over phi and get a theory for theta, which is right here. So there's two different formulations of the relativistic massless scalar field, one in terms of phi and one in terms of theta. Uh, and that's these two formulations are responsible for what's called for T duality in string theory. Uh, okay, here it's just a, a duality between superconductivity and charge density wave order uh, or things like that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say a little bit about that later. Uh, this phi field is in fact precisely the phase of the boson. It's exactly the field we met in chapter two when we had a relativistic sound mode, and this is in fact, phi field is exactly the sound mode. And we'll see why that is the case uh, probably uh, on Wednesday. Okay, <laughs> I'm over time, so questions. That was quick, but I, I am going to go a little Good books, including I recommend, highly recommend. Uh, which goes through this. Or you can pick up it in other ways. Juven speaks. Anybody else? Okay, Juven, go ahead. Wait, I can say something for a second. Multiple people to ask. Yes, go ahead. Equation 13, yes. uh, when you, you mentioned there's a Schrodinger analogy. Equation, 
Which equation? Which uh, equation 13? It should be 13 when you mention Schrodinger anomaly. I just want to clarify a bit. Because you are yeah. the bosonization for one plus one the fermion. And that fermion has yes. the anomaly when we evolve the left hand and right hand fermion such that they transform under U1 with opposite transformation. That's the actual or, or chiral transformation. So left fermion number minus right fermion numbers U1 transform in the opposite way. Then that, ser that symmetry can have anomaly. But, right. but then right. when you earlier discussed this anomaly, it seems like you only show the, the right, right density, right? So that's why I didn't fully get why do you say that? Maybe you need quick Okay, I, I was just, okay, you're right. That was the more precise statement of what people call the anomaly. Uh, so there's this uh, commutation here. Thank you for clarifying. There's this commutation here for the right movers. There's a similar commutation for the left movers. And notice that has the opposite sign. So if I take right, okay. uh, this, the, 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 the full density, rho right plus rho left, then there is I can so. commutator yeah. zero. Right, if right. I so subtract the difference, that's right, yes. Uh, now the difference is the density of right movers minus the density of left movers. Now, in any real system, that's not really a conserved quantity. Uh, and that's why, in a sense, they can be an anomaly. So if I go back to my picture, which unfortunately got erased, uh, so here I had some dispersion. So I was claiming, so the right movers all uh, live over here. The left movers live over here, uh, but it's possible for the system to slide. The whole Fermi C can slosh back and forth, so it can go from, uh, you know, being a Fermi C with these states occupied to a C with those states occupied. And now what's happened is some of some of the left movers have gone from the left to the right. So that's in principle allowed. <laughs> so that's not so rho right minus rho left is not really a conserved quantity uh, because it can change under these processes. But in this theory that I wrote down, this theory that I wrote down here, uh, this relativistic theory, um, if you write it in terms of left and right movers, they, are, they don't, see, yeah, you can not really see it here. You know, for this theory as written here, the number of left movers and number of right movers are conserved. There's nothing changing the number, nothing allowing you to change that. Okay, so anyway, so the continuum limit has an emergent conservation law uh, and that conservation law uh, can, can be anomalous, meaning that when you apply certain things, like for example, if you apply a, an electric field, if you try to drive a current through the system and you apply an electric field to this Fermi system, this is exactly what it does. It will just convert left movers to right movers. So the this state here is the current carrying state. It's a state where current is going in the right uh, because there's more right movers than left movers. So when you apply an electric field, which is like uh, what you're doing in electric field is you're, you're gauging the, uh, the difference of the charges between the left and right and, and that that leads to a violation. There's no conservation law. There's a current uh, that flows, which is precisely fixed by the anomaly fact. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I I, I understand these I things. With, I, I, agree with, I agree with you. Left plus right is vector symmetry, no anomaly. But left minus right, there's an actual anomaly. And you just need to combine the two formula, the left and right in a way, plus or minus, and then get what you want. Yeah, uh, no but I, I, you know, if, if you look back at some earlier, this is called the Schwinger, right? You're right, I shouldn't have called it the Schwinger anomaly. I don't think Schwinger even you ever use the word anomaly. Uh, so it's the Schwinger term, right? Which gives you an anomaly for the chiral current, which is left movers minus right movers. Thank you. All right, great. So uh, discussion, further discussion tomorrow morning. Uh, and I'm going to continue with this note. So, uh, you know, I, they're on the website. So please have them in front of you. 
uh, next lecture because it will be easier to, to follow what I'm saying as I jump back and forth between different different slides. I mean, if I did this all, writing everything out would take forever, and I'm sure I got all the signs wrong. So, and there's so many formula to, to keep track of and so many signs to get right that I'm just going to use the notes. <laughs> all right, so see you tomorrow morning. Uh, and there's also section tomorrow, I guess, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.